what people admired about Aaron was his musical talent. Um, he played several instruments, keyboard, acoustic guitar, electric guitar, the drums, the trumpet, banjo, and he was pretty much self-taught and he was really good. We called him a freak of nature because we don't really know where that came from. And one of the things that really, I guess maybe in the last two years that he did that was astonishing, is he bought this, I mean, like my wife said, we don't know anything about music, but he bought this thing that he would play the keyboard and then he would go play his guitar, then he'd go play his drums and whatever instruments he wanted to play. And then he'd put it all into this machine and it sounded like he had a full piece band other than the singing. <laughs> And I just sounded, I, he was very, very smart in the way of music, and he just loved it. And when he really was down, he would go to his music. He was a very well-mannered child. He was quiet, um, smart in school. He was athletic. He played in sports. Um, he was very respectful to his parents. And, and, yes, he had this sense of humor, and, yes, he could light up a room like everybody else's kid does. But we've heard so many amazing stories since he's passed about those things that he did kind of in the background to help people. He would help people that were struggling with drug addiction and suicide, believe it or not, or just having family issues or just anything. He was always there to listen to people. And we heard that over and over and over again. Um, how he would even help owners of stores to do little things around their stores, um, stop and help somebody change a tire or get their key lock their keys that have been locked in their car. He just stopped to help. We heard all sorts of stories like that afterwards. Now we did hear because he had gotten a new truck that was really tall, had really big tires, and we had a flood in our hometown, and he got a big thrill out of taxiing people across the low water crossings in that big truck of his. So we did hear about that story because he got such a kick out of it. As a teenager still, he was introduced to marijuana. So that's what he started with. You know, we warned him the gateway drug type thing, but he struggled a lot with anxiety and depression and I could, I could say that he self-medicated. He got into some drug use, and but at the time of his death, he was doing so much better on a much better path, and then it was over. So, you know, my wife had said he started off with marijuana, and she was really a lot closer observing things. You know, as men, we we just kind of look, we don't look right on it. And I just know that one of the things that really concerned me is he was working at a golf course and he would be cleaning the golf carts. And we found out, and this was, I don't know how old he was, but he was pretty young. He might've been sixth grade or something, maybe seventh, but he would uh, find beer in the golf carts that the golfers had left that hadn't been open, of course. And he would, he started drinking those. And uh, I'm not saying that led to the marijuana, but it was kind of, it was kind of cool. He said, you know, to drink that and feel pretty good. And we noticed he changed the kids he was running around with. So he chose a different group to run around with. It was scary. Of course, some of them, he was attracted to them because they were musicians and he wanted to find people that he could play music with. So that part's understandable, but I guess they, they just were into that, so he kind of joined them. Peer pressure, maybe? Be real honest with you, it was terrible. Um, <clears throat> because our, our, our background of our family was a very conservative family, and I was a very, pretty much headstrong daddy, and I just thought I could stop him when I saw it. I just really thought, because I've been able to stop him in other things, and uh, 
when I realized that what I said really didn't matter, he was respectful about it, but he just kept going at it. Um, it just broke my heart. I, 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 we, I tried everything as a dad uh, with him. He and our golf is our thing. And, and I, when he started those, our golf stopped uh, for a while. And it just progressed. He got into probably just about everything. Uh, cocaine, methamphetamines, Xanax, Percocet. I, I don't, I don't even know what all it was. At one point, he was at a party here in Austin, actually, and he collapsed, and his friends, friends, drove him to the hospital and basically left him at the front door, and when the medical personnel came to him, he actually didn't have any signs of life. But they took him in real quick into the emergency room and worked their magic, and he came out of that. I even wonder to this day if fentanyl was involved in that. Um, but we'll, we'll not know. That was quite a few years ago. But that was one of those things where this will do it. This will turn our boy around. But it didn't, sadly. It didn't at all. I think he was just too deep into it at that point in time. Later he came out of it. He did. Not fully, obviously, but. He never ran from me that I, 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 that I know of. He was, even when he was really not there, um, there was times when he was so messed up. And it was, and sometimes it kind of scared me, but he never, he had never hit me or his mother, but um, just seeing, seeing him come and still want to talk to me. Um, we've had many of conversations. At one point, I, he had gone to stay with my, our daughter, and he was doing, uh, dealing some drugs. And um, I said, Aaron, I, I really need to talk to you. And he said, I don't want to talk to you. I know what you want to talk about. And I said, well, just give me the time. And he said, I'll meet you at the Walmart parking lot. And so we did. We sit in the car. And I, I tried just encouraging him. And um, while he listened, he was just so focused that he felt like this was the right thing that he needed to be doing. And it was so far from what we had taught. We didn't have alcohol in our house. Uh, we didn't smoke. And I say, we, my wife and I, we... We focused on our kids. We homeschooled them for the longest time. And so I really thought that our friendship at that time, I would be able to gain, gain some ground with it. But it, uh, I, never, I never gave up on him. And, 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 and he, he knew that. Um, so I just wasn't able to make a, make a change. And we've realized, and I'm sure everybody that's given these interviews the, the drugs are so powerful, they don't even know what they're doing. They don't realize how much it's affected them, and it's just, that's sad. So I can't just blame. It wasn't Aaron that was doing that to his dad. It, it wasn't. It was what was in him. Just begged him to stop. Begged him to stop. My husband even told him, or we told him, that, you know, you're going to end up in prison or six feet under if you don't make a change. But he's young. I think they, a lot of them just think they're in, invincible, untouchable. I got this. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> what really hurt my wife and I is we thought the church would help us. Now, we were to raise our kids, but we knew the youth directors, and we knew some of the, I guess what you could call the really good church kids, which come find out later they weren't really good. But we really said, look, we see something going on in here, and can, can, you, can you just reach out and let's disciple them a little bit, would you please? And uh, they said, okay, but it didn't happen. 
Then we put him in, and I won't name names, but it's a very well, very popular organization for kids that are going through difficult times. Nothing. I would, I would drop him off, and he would get excited. Uh, but they just were kind of turned off. He was high maintenance. And uh, that killed us. And then also having some friends that just disowned us uh, and him because they just didn't have that problem with their kids and they didn't understand. So you're really, my wife and I were in a, and our family were in a boat by ourselves. It's a lot of times. It was just, I, I am angry still. Because I really feel like the church and this organization is still doing the same. And in fact, this one organization, I, I told them, I, you get in there and you help him, and I'll show up, and, and I always did, and I'll, I'll donate money to this organization if you can help work on him, and it didn't even work. So, and again, I wasn't there to have, for them to fix it, but I wanted some support. They're not there. It's too heavy. It's too much. I think I was going to cry, but man, that's that's emotional. That hits because we raised our kids in church, and we we spent a lot of time in there and with helping and serving and reaching out to others. And this is when our kids were a little bitty, and we just felt like they're going to be there for us. No, and I'm not bad mouthing the church. I know that not all of them are like that, but it's tough. Going back, our kids from when they were first born, my wife would bring them in a basket, you know, and we'd go to church. And um, then they grew up and they'd go through the Sunday school class and they'd get into the singing programs and, and uh, 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 drama. And they were so into the church. And uh, then when they got older, and some, especially with Aaron, that's who we're talking about, when it got to where he was having his difficult times, he really, in some ways, thought that the church was going to be there for him. But if he, it, it really hurt him so much that he didn't want anything to do with it anymore. And he didn't. I, he would come, came with us, I think, one Easter, and uh, maybe two years before he died or something. But... Uh, it just turned him off, and that broke our heart because you would think that'd be a positive thing. He had more, he had better fellowship in a bar. They cared about him more in a bar than in the church. Now I don't want to sit here and bang on the church, but it's just, just watching him, and then a daddy getting frustrated because he was crying out, you know, help me. The day that the police found Aaron, we had gone to do a, um, to check on him because we hadn't heard from him, and so we ended up calling the police, and they came to do a welfare check. And uh, when they came out to tell us, and just even before the evening was over, they had a, a gut feeling it was fentanyl. I'd never even heard of that, so we got a real quick education. He always wanted to be like me, and I said, "Don't." I'll never feel my dad's footsteps. You be you. But the love and the respect. Do you know, he would never let any of the, his friends, if they came over and started foul-mouthing or doing any things that were wrong, he would stop them and say, you're not doing that for my mom and dad. Uh, he loved his family. So where his music was very important, it was our golf. He me being a golf professional and my daddy being his, his papa being a golf professional, he really got into golf. And uh, the night that he died, we had, he had a, I told the police he had a video in his house. So they went in and they looked at it. And you know, it was probably around three hours, maybe two hours before he died. I haven't seen it because I don't think I can do it, but he'd got his golf clubs out in his living room and he wadded up pieces of paper and he was chipping him to a trash can. And that tells me that he didn't want to die. He, you know, he had been on drugs off and on, but he had gotten cleaned up. But this little fentanyl, we know 
He did not know it was in there because he was ready to play. He was ready to play golf. He was ready to get back with his family. But that, that drug, I won't be playing golf anymore. When Aaron died, we grieved differently. So we've just allowed each other to do that. Just have your time and do it however you need to do it. Um, and But just know, we had this agreement in the very beginning, I don't have enough of anything in me, left in me, to help comfort you and vice versa. And maybe some couples can do that. But we just decided it was too much of a burden for either one of us to you know, pull each other out of that. If I see that my husband's having a hard day, I just kind of pat him on the back, give him a hug and keep going. And he does the same for me because we can't do anything for each other. You just, you just can't, you, you can't grieve for somebody else. I can't grieve for him and he can't grieve for me. So it's something you just kind of have to plow through and work through. But even not only, and further than that, it's affected our family. We're trying to pull it back together, but we just crumbled. All of us did that day. We just absolutely fell apart. And, uh, but we're pulling it back together. We are getting closer. We've always been a close family, but that just, that just devastated us. I tell my, my husband, I'm not the person I used to be. I'm not the wife I used to be. I'm not the mom I used to be because we have three other children. I'm not the grandma I used to be. This may or may not be my new normal. I don't know. It's still hard, though. But what is helpful is that we've met other parents who are living the same nightmare and the same hell that we are. It's a club that none of us want to be in, though. I, uh, I know that my wife said a whole lot, and uh, we all just love him very much. Um, my, uh, you have those woulda, coulda, shoulda. But I know that we couldn't have stopped what happened. It was just a, a train. And the best part about it all is, I know when he received Christ, I know when he was baptized, and he even, I found out after his death that he was telling people, one lady in particular, that was so confused about who God was, she was telling me after, because she was of a denomination that didn't talk much about Jesus. And he listened to her for a while and he said, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah. Have you ever thought about getting a relationship with Jesus? And she was probably 18, 19 years old. And she said, I, Reed, I, t I told her and I went, what are you talking about? We stand up and we sit down and we pray and we take communion and isn't that it? Uh, I mean, they want me to be perfect and I can't be perfect and I'm so frustrated and Aaron said, you don't have to be perfect with Jesus. He died on the cross. And this doesn't have to even be on film. I'm just saying this, I'm starting to preach, but he, he died on a cross for you and he loves you and you don't have to try. You just let him live in you. And she said, I'll never forget that of him. She's crying. And uh, she said that blessed her because she did find a relationship. Plus, he encouraged her to go on, get off the drugs, and be that dental hygienist that you wanted to be. And she said, Mr. Norman, I'm a dental hygienist. I'm off drugs in San Antonio. Our son's living on. But there's many more stories. <laughs>